Welcome to New Line 99. This episode is about the storage of software on the system. We're mostly talking about legacy storage on the system, not really touching on modern innovations involving add-ons like SD cards. So you finished writing a program, and it's in your TI's memory. What happens now? Well, if you just power off the system, your work is gone forever. There has to be a way to store it permanently, so that you could bring it up the next time. At the time when the TI-99 came out, file storage was done on magnetic media. Some users had access to a floppy disk system, where files can be stored for random access. On the system, disk drives were referred to by their device name DSK followed by a device number usually DSK-1. Whatever file you wanted to store or retrieve, you enter that device name, period, and then the name of the file. The TI traditionally uses five and a quarter inch floppy disks. A floppy disk is a thin magnetic medium cut out into a circle. It's very susceptible to damage if you touch the surface. Scratch it, get it wet, get it dirty, bend it up, breathe on it, look at it wrong, call it dirty names, you get the idea. So the circular disk is encased in a rigid square piece of plastic that protects the surface. There is a circle cut in the middle where the mechanical drive can grab the disk with a spindle and rotate it to any of nine wedges of the disk with a motor. There's a little window exposing a small portion of the surface where the head actuator can position the read-write head to access any of the 40 tracks of data. Each track separated into nine wedge positions marks the start of a sector, and that's where your data is stored. So that makes 40 tracks, 9 sectors, 256 bytes per sector, meaning you can store about 90k of software on one disk. If we could visualize the magnetic contents of the disk, this is how it might look. When you request access to a file, the computer first checks the volume information block in sectors 0 and 1. It looks for the file descriptor record, a place on the disk containing the file's name, size, type of file, and list of all the sectors on the disk containing part of the file. As you save files to disk, the TI stores them on the disk starting from the outer rings and working its way to the inner rings. When the disk is full, the TI will return an error. It isn't like modern systems. A disk full error can happen when you're in the middle of storing a file. You don't get any warning, and you can end up with a partial file on disk. So it's good to monitor the amount of space you have on your disks as you put things on them. Back in the day, getting a disk drive for the system was expensive. And if it was part of the peripheral expansion system, it was also very noisy. Back when the system was released, a lot of us only used audio cassettes for storage. The system came with a Y cable to connect cassette recorder microphone and earphone jacks, allowing you to store information on audio cassettes as sounds. The cable it came with had wires to connect two cassette recorders. The devices were named CS1 and CS2. CS2 could only save, whereas CS1 could both save and load from cassette. One of the drawbacks to saving files on cassette is that it's a sequential medium. You'll have to know where the program you want is located on the tape, cue it up with fast forward or rewind, and then press play when the TI is ready to load it. The same thing with saving. You have to cue the tape to a place where you know does not contain files. To load a program from cassette from a basic command prompt, type old, O-L-D, CS1. It'll tell you to rewind the cassette to a location where you'd like to begin reading a file. Press enter, then it'll tell you to play. Do that and press enter again. And if all goes well, when it reaches the end of the file, it'll say data okay and tell you to stop the cassette. To save a program to cassette, type either save CS1 or save CS2. It'll tell you to rewind the cassette to a location where you would like to begin recording the file. Press enter and then it'll tell you to press record on the cassette recorder. Press enter again, and then it'll begin recording the file. When it's done, it'll give you the opportunity to play it back into the computer to verify it was recorded in good quality. How is data stored on a cassette as sound? The zeros and ones, also called space and mark bits, have different frequencies. Zeros are stored at 689 hertz, and ones are 1379 hertz. 
When you save to cassette, the first thing the TI does is send 4.5 seconds worth of zeros, in case the cassette recorder needs to adjust to the volume of the upcoming signal. After that, there is a data mark, an indication of the number of records in the file, and the actual data in the file, in 64-byte frames, until there are no more records left. After each record frame, it sends a repeat frame, in case of any problems recording the signal. At the end of every frame, it sends a checksum byte. If you add up all the bytes and don't get that number, there was some sort of problem with recording the data. But times have changed. Floppies and floppy drives, and even cassettes and cassette players are harder to find these days. There are several modern digital recorders on the market that you might think would suffice as an acceptable device to save TI programs. But unfortunately, most devices like this use encoding algorithms like MP3 or WMA that do not keep the integrity of the original bitstream. If you end up using one, you'll probably experience data errors. If cassette data is saved as WAV or audio interchange formats, even at 11 kilohertz, the TI should be able to read it. There are several different file types on the TI that are used for different reasons. If you're storing data, each piece of data is separated in records. The records can be stored in display mode for regular strings or numbers, or internal mode to store binary type information. When you open a data file in either of these modes, you can also specify whether you want the records to be variable length or fixed length along with a record size. Variable length lets you save space on your disk, since you don't have to pad every record to the same length. But fixed length allows you to not have to move records around, grow and shrink the whole file in the disk every time a string in one of the middle records happens to change length. Let's look at a quick example where we open an output file in BASIC, store three records in it by printing to that device, and then close it. We'll choose fixed length records of 32 bytes each. After we run it, if we had the ability to peek at the file, we would see the data in three records, each padded to 32 characters. Now let's write a program to load those records back into a basic program. We open it the same way, indicating input instead of output, using the input statement to that device to load all of the records, and then display each record on the screen until we detect the end of the file. We see that it pulls in the same data that we stored. There is also a file format for program files. All information is stored in bulk, without the need for one unifying system of record markers. As the name would suggest, BASIC and Extended BASIC use this format to store and retrieve programs. However, the programs are not stored in simple text, but instead stored in three sections. There's a header section indicating the address boundaries in VDP, where the program will be stored, a table containing all the line numbers used in the program and their VDP locations, and then the commands used in the program. But if you peek at the contents of the file it creates, you'll find that all the keywords and symbols have been substituted with a one-byte code. The keyword if, for example, is stored as hexadecimal 84. Equals is now BE and then becomes B0. Every command and symbol in BASIC has a one byte code with special codes to indicate that upcoming information is a line number, a string, or a variable name. Is there any way to actually see the symbolized code in BASIC? Yes, through an unusual exploit. For example, if you type a BASIC line 10 rem and then hold down control while typing QRSTUV typing the control codes for those characters, when you list it back, you'll find some of the symbol assignments in BASIC. It's just a fun little trick. That's all we're doing on storage right now. Hope to catch you again on the next episode. So long from New Line 99.